Welcome back to more Warmer Lore. In today's video, we'll be delving into the vampire counts once again. This time, however, we will be taking a closer look at the army of the vampire counts, from individual units to overall tactics and what makes them unique in the Warhammer world. As always, I will be pulling this information from the latest army books as well as the novels, and some of it will in fact be my own thoughts and opinions on fighting tactics and uses. Oh, and Per my previous army videos, we will also be comparing the units from the Total War Warhammer video game with the roster from the tabletop. So let's begin with the army video. And one more quick PR statement before we start. I will be reading you descriptions from the army book. So if you think you may have heard it before, that is where it's coming from. And then I will of course elaborate on that and then delve into the Total War comparison. So let's start off with the infantry. And let's begin with the zombies. Zombies are shambling horrors that are used extensively by the vampire counts and other undead powers to be used as simple cannon fodder, staggering towards the enemy battle line in a slow yet noisome horde. Grotesquely reanimated corpses, they are compelled by the dark magic of a vampire or necromancer and driven by the will of their master to commit acts of extreme violence. Zombies are a truly foul thing to behold living corpses that is wroth with decay and unclean flesh. A zombie's skin hangs in strips from its tattered frame, revealing withered muscle and bloodless veins. With the use of dark magic, the zombies stagger towards the enemies with grasping arms and teeth. These are the bread and butter of any vampire count army. Zombies are what are used to bog down troops and grind down any opposition. While not very effective at actually killing their targets, they do have an unnerving effect on the living as they cause fear in mortals, a trait that almost every unit in the Vampire Counts roster has. They also are brought in ridiculous numbers and can be replenished by being knit back together with necromantic power or raising the very enemies they kill. In this way, they truly can be an innumerable horde as one of the perks of necromancy is being able to piece back together any troops you lose in a fight while still in combat. In Total War, we see the zombies functioning just as they do in tabletop. Expendable, high number units that are cheap and good for eating arrow fire, cavalry charges, or bogging down elite troops or monsters that would best be brought down with numbers rather than throwing in your better units to deal with them. They also make excellent flanking troops because they cause fear, but they are horrendously slow, and thus the raise dead spell that summons a unit of zombies anywhere on the field can be used in this method, or for tying down skirmishers. And then we move on to the skeleton warriors, which as their name implies are skeletons that have been raised from their graves to fight, willingly or not on the behalf of the necromancer who raised them, forming the overall backbone of most undead armies under the control of the vampire counts. For thousands of years, armies have marched and fought across the old world since the time of its creation. There is barely a field, hill, or valley that has not seen fierce fighting at some point in the past, going as far back as the reign of Sigmar Heldenhammer, and even earlier. These great battles have left many unmarked and unblessed graves scattered across the old world. Such charnel fields often attract large influx of dark magic, forcing the souls of some warriors to remain trapped within their material realm. Some are the spirits of men betrayed by their commanders, others are of cowards who were cut down as they ran, or those who died a violent and unexpected death. Unable to find peace due to their actions, these spirits are forever bound to their corpse. They lay within the earth. Beneath the mud lie the grave-stained bones of these bitter ancient warriors, long held beneath the earth. They are clad in their corroded armor, their lifeless hands still gripping their swords, axes, spears, and shields they held during the time of their death. It is important to note that all beings raised by necromancy can in fact be banished by normal weapons, usually. This is important because skeleton warriors, as you may have noticed, do not have any skin or flesh to injure. Their organs and muscles that usually use are what the body uses to move are replaced with um, dark magic, the essence of necromancy, and it links to the caster can be severed, causing the skeleton to collapse in a pile of bones. Of course, similar to the zombie, it can be pieced back together after the fact in almost any state. 
the quickest way to actually take down a skeleton warrior is to either cleave the spine or the skull as that is where the necromantic link is the strongest now skeletons are also brought in rather large numbers not as many as zombies but far more than regular troops and they are better fighters than zombies though not by much they are nothing compared to living men for they are still reliant on a necromancer to give them orders and similar to the tomb king variety they have some basic knowledge of fighting prowess carried over from their time amongst the living but it is not anywhere close to what they were capable as a living being in total war we see the skeleton warriors in both a sword and shield and a spear variety they function very similar to the tabletop description as a very low tier melee troop and the spear variety are the only actual anti-large infantry unit in the vampire counts roster making them very important especially in online battles and as a good cheap anti-large measure which sadly the vampires are lacking and then we move on to the more elite grave guard or whites as they are sometimes called they are the undead corpses of long past heroes and warlords that have been arisen from their graves with a partial flicker of the original soul still trapped within allowing the undead to fight the enemies of the necromancer that raised them with the skills and tools of his former life on other occasions whites are often arisen by their own means when the place of the rest such as a tomb or mound was desecrated by outside intruders forcing the deceased spirit to be sucked into his former body by the dark magic that permeates from such an evil place although their bodies have decayed leaving only bones and tattered flesh a grave guard is held together by evil magic so strong that it has endured for centuries they were ancient battle gear of primitive alloy corroded by time and dust with the years these eerie silent sentinels stand constant vigil on the crumbling battlements of many sylvanian castles never resting and eternally ready to defend their vampire masters when a vampire marches forth his grave guard advances at the head of the undead host they form a formidable core of warriors using the skills and tools of their former life to their own advantage the grave guard are the most elite troops at the vampire's disposal as their heavy armor and rather high combat stats make them some of the most durable and stout infantry in the warhammer world this is mostly due to the fact that they do not rot but instead slowly degrade if they are losing in combat all the while chipping away at the enemy whereas a mortal infantry would normally have routed and not been capable of weathering a unwinnable situation until aid could be had from a different part of the battlefield also great guard do have much more autonomy than the average skeleton warrior and are capable of fighting in a much more disciplined and deadly fashion in total war grave guard come in two varieties sword and shield and great weapons they both have a bonus towards infantry making them ideal for meeting the enemy infantry head on the sword and shield are good for taking on unarmored infantry and the great weapons are good for cutting through the heaviestly armored units in the game making them one of the most elite troops that you can afford and then we move on to crypt ghouls also known simply as ghouls are the degenerated descendants of humans who were reduced to cannibalistic creatures due to the consumption of raw or decaying flesh crypt ghouls are ugly stooping creatures with only a vestigial sense of their former life or personality their skin is sallow and filthy their eyes are bestial and insane and their snarling lips reveal sharp pointed teeth in slavering mouths dressed only in the rags they pull from their victims crypt ghouls carry weapons that have they've either picked up or have crudely fashioned from the remains of their unwholesome meals usually these skulking fiends do not need such implements to kill for they have long claws and powerful teeth sufficient enough for these needs these claws are encrusted with great filth and decaying meat those that take even the slightest scratch from their talons can die from unnaturally potent infections that spread through their victim's body in addition their constant diet of rot felled meat confers a sinewy and unwholesome resilience to most diseases crypt ghouls are essentially the wendigos of the warhammer world they are what happens to men that partake in that little bit of sweet pork <laughs> or cannibalism 
In the army book, it states that all Crypt Ghouls are descendants of cannibal tribes from the Southlands. But from the novels, we know that anyone can become one of these simply by becoming a cannibal. And in fact, the largest packs are usually the descendants of the Yargul, the uh, race of men that inhabited Nagashizar before the coming of the great necromancer, whom forced them to fight in his armies and then forced them to eat both their and their enemies dead after a battle, resulting in tribes of Crypt Ghouls. On a whole, Crypt Ghouls, while very deadly in combat, are actually very cowardly creatures, hence why they usually eat the dead and not the living, which makes them ideal for flanking an enemy or chasing down routing units, as they actually are relatively fast for infantry, especially for a vampire count army. Now, they do not make good frontline troops. They are also one of the very few technically living creatures in the vampire count's army, but they do not subsist off of a form of dark magic. They, still, they'll, they are still attracted to it which is why they are drawn to necromancers and vampires in the first place, and why they are also easily dominated and controlled, as they are very stupid. <laughs> and also, of course, they are drawn towards dark magic, making it easy to control them. In Total War, the Crypt Ghouls function as they do in Tabletop, as a fast flanking force with poison attacks, which makes them even better for chasing down routing units or helping take down superior units with other troops. And then we move on to something a few of you have asked about, the Crypt Horrors. They are a variation of the common ghoul who have consumed the blood of a vampire. Given the creature supernatural size and strength and used by many undead factions as a form of heavy shock infantry, the malformed monstrosities known as Crypt Horrors are thankfully a rare sight spoken of in hushed whispers by Night Watchmen, old priests of Moor, gravekeepers, and other nocturnal citizens of the Empire. The few persistent reports of these looming and moon-mad things are dismissed as the ravings of superstitious fools. At best, they are thought to be exaggerated sightings of unnaturally large crypt ghouls. Unfortunately for the lands of the Old World, however, the stories are often accurate, for crypt horrors are very, very real. In order to create a crypt horror, a vampire must open his vein to a ghoul and allow it to gulp down his precious blood, which, which is essentially a pale bastardization of the blood kiss and an act that is reviled by those who count themselves among the elite of the Sylvanian society. As such, these acts are often perpetrated by only the most desperate of vampires, most specifically the vampires of the Strigoi bloodline. For a Strigoi to allow a crypt ghoul's forted mouth to sink its into its flesh is a sign that the vampire is truly desperate. Nonetheless, some ghoul kings do encourage this strange and abhorrent practice. Now, the original creator of crypt horrors was actually Wusorin, the progenitor of the Necrarch bloodline, but he did this while he was still in the empire of Strigos, and so it is safe to assume that the ghoul kings would have picked up on this from their time in their former empire. Now, Crypt Horrors are freakishly tall ghouls, heavily muscled, and completely bloodthirsty, as the vampiric blood almost puts them into a frenzy, as well as endows them with a healthy dose of regeneration. Typically in the lore, Crypt Horrors are used as elite shock troops, as unlike ghouls, they are certainly not cowardly and are capable of taking mortal wounds and still fighting. They also can be useful as living creatures to smash and deface any holy symbols or wards for the undead, as they are in a kind of limbo between worlds and therefore are not as affected from these sigils, which allows vampires to plunder many tombs and entire graveyards that otherwise would be out of reach for them with the blessings of the gods. In Total War, Crypt Horrors act just like shock troops with regeneration and poison attacks. They are not meant to take a charge head on, but they are meant to either counter charge or charge in after the fact. They are excellent at flanking units as well as helping the front lines as they are. Regeneration will help them keep in the fight far longer than what their base stats would lead you to believe. They also are considered large entities and being, can be used as a spearhead to smash through an enemy unit and pull through to squish your targets or 
the more useful aspect of pinning any other large enemies in place while you slowly grind them down. And then that leads us into the Karen Wraiths, which are hooded spectral spirits of former necromancers or sorcerers that have used the corrupting influence of dark magic to extend their lives far beyond their mortal limit, but at the price of losing one's own mortal body. Though their appearance may perceive it, these spirits are not servants of more, the Death God, in any way, for they have defied the Death God's authority by preventing the inevitability of their deaths and continuing to do so even in the afterlife. Afraid of the punishment that lies for them in the afterlife, these spirits will try anything to cling to this fading world. Within the material world, these spirits are amongst the most dreaded of all in dead. Lacking physical forms altogether, they cannot be put down by axe, sword, or hammer. Even the strongest faith, such as exorcisms used by a warrior priest, cannot banish such creatures easily. Worse still, the icy touch of a Karen Wraith drains the warm essence of mortal men completely. A Karen Wraith is capable of reaching into the body of an adversary and closing its freezing claws around the victim's vital organs, sending painful chills that kills the man instantly. The vampire counts purposely bind these Karen Wraiths, willing or not, to his service and uses them as a form of near-invincible shock infantry. Accompanied by units of deathless warriors, these sinister spirits glide across the battlefield, tattered road rippling in the etheric winds of their arrows, bullets, and bolts which pass harmlessly through them. Unhindered by cannonballs or flame, the wraiths close in on their prey, seeking out and cutting down the enemy without so much as a whisper. The crippling fear that arises from having to fight a nigh-unkillable, scythe-wielding specter can make even the most bravest men flee the battlefield. Because they are impervious to physical weaponry, only the raw energies of magic or a well-placed blow from an enchanted weapon can slay a Karen wraith. It is perhaps a blessing, then, that the Karen Wraiths are so few in numbers within the entirety of the Old World. Now, it is important to note that Karen Wraiths are not only dead necromancers, but any user of dark magic, meaning any user of the Wind of Dar, in addition to the foul corruption of necromancy. It does appear that these souls are only that of humans, though, as Dark Elves are not exactly seen or found amongst the Karen Wraiths, even though they would be the general practitioners of dark magic. Now, in Total War, Karen Wraiths are both a powerful and a fragile unit. You see, to represent their tabletop role, they have a massive physical resistance. Not 100%, because that would be ridiculous in <laughs> the Total War game, but pretty damn close. And so they can chew through almost any infantry unit, with the exception of anything that does a kind of damage other than physical. Primarily magic damage, which can be imbued through several spells on any unit, or simply dropping a damage spell upon them before they even reach combat. In this way, Karen Wraiths can be quickly deleted from the battlefield without ever getting into combat, and there is no sure way to screen out magic from your opponent. So. They do make an excellent support unit, and since they do cause horror, they also make a good armor-piercing and flanking force, capable of routing even the hardened elite troops and super heavy armor. But, as I said before, they also have a glaring weakness in the magic department, making them a very fragile unit as well. And then last but not least for the infantry is the Spirit Host which are a common sight amongst the armies of the dead, a horde of ethereal ghosts that swarm across the battlefield where neither blade nor bullets can find purchase. Across Sylvania, poltergeists and ghosts haunt peasants with dreadful groans and freezing touches, sometimes driving whole villages to be abandoned as a result. When the vampire counts go to war, these restless spirits are pulled along by the dark magics of the undead army. Insubstantial and impervious to mortal weapons, these angry ghosts swarm over the enemy, leeching energies from the living and leaving stark horror in their wake. Spirit hosts are essentially a more numerous, less powerful version of Karen Wraiths, meant to bog down enemies similar to zombies in that way, but obviously much better. Now, I do not see these ever being actually brought into Total War. They are not currently in the roster. And there are no actual swarm units, which is what these are considered, in Total War yet that have made it into the game as an actual unit. 
though some have been turned into spells. And so maybe with an addition of maybe a new lord or a new faction someday, maybe we'll see the um, spirit host as a racial ability or a special trait. But honestly, the roster doesn't need them. And the Karen rates really do make them superfluous in a way. And that is it for the infantry for the vampire counts. They are very slow with the exception of the crypt ghouls and the crypt whores. It is a very slow grindy infantry core. Very strong because since they don't rout, they don't run away and they do cause fear. Every single one of the units cause fear with the exception of the Karen race which cause terror. Oh, and the Karen race, any ethereal unit moves very quickly as well. <laughs> I should also mention that. But let's get out of the infantry and let's move into the cavalry. Starting with the Black Knights. They are the horrific reanimated corpses of long dead tribal chieftains and primeval knights who are raised from their resting places by necromancers and vampires. In the times before the empire, there were few domesticated horses and horsemen were exceedingly rare. In most tribes, a steed was a symbol of wealth and status. So it was often only that a chieftain and his closest warriors could ride mounts into battle. The wealthiest of their numbers clad in crude iron plate and carrying stout shields. When these early knights died, their horses were ritually killed and buried in the barrels alongside their masters so that they may carry their de deceased master into the afterlife. Many centuries later, the vampire counts are known to summon forth these gruesome remains of these ancient knights in order to bolster the ranks of the lesser undead minions under their control. When called into battle, Black Knights would often form into squadrons of powerful shock cavalry. During their mortal lives, these unearthly knights use weapons bearing enchantments of destruction. Though corrupted by the patina of the ages, these tools of slaughter are no less potent than when the wielder was a man of flesh and blood. It is said that once someone is pierced by a Black Knight's lance or sword, the wound it created will never recover. As well as enchanted weapons, the Black Knight's steeds are said to be trapped between worlds due to the ritual that binds the steed to its master. As such, there have been reports of Black Knights galloping straight through the rubble of ruined cities or even charging across the surfaces of a lake without leaving so much as a ripple. With these advantages, the unliving cavaliers would then crash themselves headlong into the ranks of their still living enemies, spitting their foes on lances wreathed in cold flame and lashing out with heavy swords older than the Empire itself. Black Knights are much more elite than the average skeleton and in fact are actually considered whites or the skeleton of the skeleton warriors that make up the graveyard in a way. This makes them extremely deadly in combat as they retain their fighting prowess they had as a mortal to an extent. In Total War we see these units split into knights with sword and shield meant to grind down infantry and skirmishers and lances and shields meant to hammer an anvil with the low tier vampire fodder troops to crush the enemy. Both are deadly in their own way and a staple to the vampire count roster as they are a decently somewhat fast unit for heavy cavalry though unfortunately they do not have the ethereal steeds that they do in tabletop which is that little bit you heard about them being able to run through rubble and walls and things like that so they are relatively quick for a vampire count army heavily armored very heavily armored and still relatively cheap in consideration of what they are capable making them a very good cavalry unit for the vampire counts. And then we move on to Hex Wraiths, also known as Reaper Knights, and they are a type of wraith, ethereal spirits born from the depths of the underworld, sent forth into the world of the living to hunt down those evil men who would dare defy their fate and the will of the Death God. The first sightings of the Hex Wraiths are shrouded in mystery, but it is said that they are created on the cursed night of Hexensnatch, the first day of the new year tearing their way into the mortal realm from the bowels of the underworld. The Hex Wraith's shade-like existence leaves it with a hunger that only the succor of a damned soul can state. Once the curse of the Hex Wraiths has been laid upon their prey, there can be no escape. The spectral horsemen can hurtle across rivers and pass through mountainsides on their incorporeal steeds without slowing their headlong charge. 
Ironically, however, in their rush to hunt down these damned souls, they would inevitably become lured into a trap from which a powerful necromancer will bind the servants of the Death God to his will. Hex wraiths are able to move from the realm of spirits to the mortal world and back again at will. They share many similarities with Karen wraiths, though they are not bound to places of death and grief, but instead are able to roam freely. The scythe-like weapons they use to slay their prey would be lethal enough in the material realm, but because the hex wraiths shimmer between worlds, their spirit slices are able to pass through Gromril armor or scaled dragon hide without any hindrance. No one truly knows how hex wraiths were first discovered and then bound, but it is thought that the Necrarchs were the first, either by use of the stolen book of Arkan or the possible the mad genius of Melchior, also known as Wasorin, who first developed the means to bind the servants of the Death God to their will. Either way, they are now a staple of many Vampire Count's armies, not only those led by Necrarchs. In Total War, Hex Wraiths are considered ethereal, which they kind of are in the lore, as we just read, and very similar to Karen Wraiths. They have a massive physical resist, but a severe weakness to magic, making them also glass canyons. But they are extremely fast moving, and do both magical and fire damage from their attacks, making them excellent for taking down enemies that are weak to fire. Like the undead, <laughs> or anything with regeneration properties. Which is rather fitting since they are servants of Moor and supposedly charged with dragging souls back to the underworld. They also do armor piercing damage and are unhindered by all terrain from their ethereal steeds. And then we move on to our first actual vampiric unit <laughs> in the roster thus far. It's kind of ironic that the Vampire Count's army is very thin on actual vampires. <laughs> so. We move into the Blood Knights, which we have covered a little bit previously. They are essentially regular mortal knights that have been turned through their training and discipline in life is enhanced by the unnatural speed and strength of the Vampiric Curse. Blood Knights are nearly indestructible, riding with fangs bared through storms of arrow and shot. Such is their honor that they can refuse no martial challenge and will fight at the forefront of any undead army without question. It is said that even the fabled Grail Knights of Bretonia cannot match the Blood Knights lance for lance upon the field. Despite this rumor, however, such beings are a deadly anathema to vampires, and simply being near them can induce great pain and weakness. A Blood Knight's armor is encrusted with images of death and slaughter. Their blades are fell weapons inscribed with dark runes, chased with precious metals and fashioned in the likeness of evil beasts. The knights do not ride mortal steeds, but charge across the field upon evil nightmares. They are clad in thick barding, painted with disturbing icons of necromantic power. Now, I have covered a bit about the Blood Dragons and the Blood Knights in my Blood Dragon Bloodline video. I know that got a little complicated. <laughs> so, for more detailed information other than this lore blurb, feel free to watch that video. The Blood Knights are only one of the only units in the Vampire Count roster that is actually comprised of vampires. And they are a devastating unit on the field of battle. A lone vampire is a force to be reckoned with, and an entire regiment of vampires is going to destroy anything and everything it comes into contact with. And true to form, Blood Knights are some of the best heavily cavalry in the Warhammer world, perhaps only bested in damage output by a few other units, most of which would be considered monsters. Oh, and Blood Knights do not have to be Blood Dragon vampires, though they often are. But there are the Drakenhof Templars, an order of von Karstein vampires that Vlad decreed were unworthy of his name. And in Total War, Blood Knights are a fast-moving, heavy cavalry with a bonus to large, meaning they are excellent for taking down rival cavalry and monsters, so they do lack some of the armor piercing. But they do have vampiric regeneration to help them with sustained combat. And they are the only, one of the very few anti-large units that the... Um, vampire counts have access to, meaning that they are 
a precious commodity for taking on enemy cavalry, which is what they seem to be geared towards, mostly. Cavalry and occasionally the larger monsters. Not the single entity unit monsters, but the larger monsters is what they really excel at. And that's it for the Vampire Cavalry. It is a very heavy cavalry. There are no light units in the Vampire Count Cavalry. It is all heavy and meant to deal massive amounts of damage. I guess technically the Hex Race aren't heavy, but they are massive damage dealers, and that is kind of the, uh, the name of the game there. They are the hammers to the stoic shambling hordes anvil. So in that way, that's kind of how that they are meant to be played. With the exception of the regular Black Knights, um, not the ones with lances, as those are more of a grindy melee infantry, meant to actually slog it out in sustained combat, not a charging or flanking. Well, I mean, they could be used for flanking, obviously, but they also can be used as a kind of just shock, do a little bit of shock damage, and then grind out an enemy is um, also what they're used for. But that is it for Cavalry, so let's move on to the Monsters, which is a very exciting section, if I do say so myself. And we come across our first monster in the Dire Wolves, which are hunting hounds of the vampires, and their senses are as keen as they were in life. They gather in great packs around the castles and towers of the undead lords of Sylvania, their mournful howls echoing for miles across the still night. When the princes of undeath make war upon the living, the direwolves follow, treating the vampires as their pack leader. In battle, the direwolves often lope among the flanks of the undead army, driving away enemy cavalry and leaping on small, vulnerable regiments of war machine crews. Vampires sometimes keep the largest of these creatures in pens deep below their castles and towers, feeding them on local peasants until they are large and glutted, then goading them to new heights of viciousness. The vampires imbue their creations with dark magic to increase vitality and bestow a callous cunning. These monstrous creations are known as Doom Wolves, and it is these larger, more ferocious beasts that lead the direwolf packs to war. As you can see, direwolves are best used to chase off light cavalry, which they are usually fast enough to catch and to munch on squishy skirmishers and war machines. They are the fastest land-based unit in the Vampire Counts roster, and they are useful for keeping your more valuable monsters and infantry from being charged by heavy cavalry, as they are good for soaking up damage intended for more expensive targets. In Total War, Dire Wolves act similarly to their tabletop iterations, minus the Doom Wolves, unfortunately and are a great fast cheap unit to keep your opponent from skirmishing your very slow moving army into oblivion. And then we move on to Felbats. With a body as long as a grown man, Felbats are a fearsome sight. They are darker than midnight and silent as death, even when in full light. In fact, the only noises that a Felbat makes on the hunt are horrible, gobbling slurps when it sinks its distended mouth into living flesh. In truth, a Felbat bears as much resemblance to an ordinary bat as a maddened lion does to a domestic cat. Those who have encountered them, and lived, tell how they hunt with unerring accuracy, swooping down to knock knights from their saddles or pick off lone warriors unawares. Vampires view Felbats much as a Bretonian lord might his prized hunting falcon. Precious sweetmeats are offered to felbats from the ramparts of the vampire's fortress, but to harness an entire flock, a grander sacrifice must be made. A fresh victim, belly slit and screaming, or a terrified messenger sent to run into the night with his eyes put out. Once they have the scent of gore, they will fall upon the enemy battle line with bloodthirsty intent. Felbats are extremely fast, as they can obviously fly, and they come in massive numbers. They function in a role, once again, similar to zombies, but more geared towards mucking up artillery and skirmishers until your actual army can deal with them. Now, they can actually outright destroy most artillery crews, and they can definitely deal a quite a bit of damage to a skirmishing unit if it isn't capable in melee, which a lot of them are. In Total War, they are great for just that, and are an excellent expendable unit to soak up cavalry charges, and of course enemy missiles to screen your troops. 
and then we move on to the Vargeists. Vargeists are the darkness within a vampire's soul made manifest. Spoken in dark legends as towering winged humanoid monstrosities, these horrific creatures are said to be once powerful vampires that have succumbed themselves unwillingly to the darker and more bestial side of their nature due to an overexposure to dark magic. Though the Vargais once walked and talked as noble lords, these curse-born vampires have developed into ravening predators desperate for the taste of blood. They prowl the battlefield in packs, ready to pounce upon the least sign of weakness and tear a hole in enemy ranks with crimson claw and bloody fang. The creation of a Vargeist is a strange metamorphosis that takes place far from the eyes of mortals. Under the extensive castles of the von Karsteins are vast subterranean networks of basements, galleries, and dining halls with vaulted ceilings that stretch into the pitch darkness above. This ghastly domain is where the birth of a Vargeist takes place within the deepest, darkest parts of the castles. Chain-bound coffins and sculpted sarcophagi nestle upside down like cocoons. If a chance visitor were to approach these coffins and blow away the carpet of dust upon them, one could find the names of many former von Karsteins. Not all of these coffins are empty, for this hidden realm is where the von Karsteins lock away those of their family who have fallen out of favor. Those who come off worse in the endless power struggles of the vampires often find themselves prematurely buried and left at the mercy of their own relentless thirst, for there can be no greater suffering for a vampire than to not be capable of death for eons from the great thirst that racks their body. Slowly, over the course of decades, the constantly dripping water magically tainted by warp stone in the stalactites and the tainted soil of Sylvania overhead finds its way into the prisons of these unfortunates. Torpid for want of fresh blood, the slumbering vampires would unknowingly drink from the tainted water and begin to devolve and change shape, growing larger and more bestial as the diluted dark magic begins to transform their body. Whilst the transformation from humanoid into monster takes hold, the muscular Vargeist will crack open its stone prison with a great effort, casting aside its chains. The creature unfolds its leathery wings and rears up into the darkness, letting loose a terrible scream of rage and betrayal that sends great swarms of bats whirling throughout the cavernous chambers. The shattered remnants of its sarcophagus fall away, and the name and personality of its former incubant is left behind in the mire. The newborn Vargeist's first instinct is to hunt, desperate to rejuvenate, drink fresh blood after so many years. At the first taste of blood, the transformation is made permanent, and what once was a proud lord of the dead is forever cursed to an existence as a ravening beast. Though each Vargeist emerged from its prison far stronger in body, it is inevitably weaker in mind. After centuries of thirsty confinement, all they really want to do is feed. These creatures are easily bound to a vampire's will as a result, and are sent into battle in packs in order to feast on those enemies' armies, foolish enough to stray too far from the sanctuary of the main battle line. In battle, Vargeist make formidable fighters for their raw fury, and terrible hunger is undiminished by the control exerted by their cruel vampiric masters. Vargeist are also one of the actual few vampire units in the Vampire Counts roster, though this is more a glimpse into the inner beast twisted by Warpstone. For this reason, Vargeist are only present in the von Karstein armies, as the unique circumstances for their creation is not practiced elsewhere, at least in the lore. They are completely insane and feral. Any intelligence they once held is gone and replaced with unimaginable hunger and bloodlust. In addition to being excellent at dealing damage to the enemy, Vargas can fly, making them perfect for taking out skirmishers and even light cavalry. But since they are so feral, they actually do not do that great in sustained combat against anything that is decent at melee, which makes them less useful when confronted with an enemy of sturdy infantry or solid cavalry. In Total War, Vargas are good at taking out skirmishers and have the speed to hunt down light cavalry. 
but for some reason, despite being vampires, they do not have any kind of regeneration, which is very odd. But they do cause fear amongst their enemies, making them an excellent flanking unit and able to immediately flank battle lines as they can fly over the top of them and then attack from the rear. And then we move on to the Vargulfs, which are the powerful yet devolved vampire lords that have since succumbed themselves willingly to their most primal urges, turning their once human bodies into a creature larger and far more powerful in body, but much weaker in mind. Within most vampires, there is a constant animalistic urge that can occasionally drive a vampire to bouts of uncommon savagery and bloodlust. Such urges are what forces a vampire to suck the blood of the living. Most vampires who still want to cling to their sanity are often known to seek control of this side of their existence and in keeping to their trappings of aristocracy of nobility. However, there are some within their numbers that find little love for such noble life. Unlike those vampires that have turned to Vargeists by means of mutation from Warpstone, a Vargulf is created when a vampire simply allows the animalistic urge to overcome them, and in the process, destroy what was left of their former personality. These feral predators abandoned their dark castles in order to run unfettered through the forest. Those who revel in such behavior become physically changed beyond recognition by the vampiric curse. Over the centuries, these developed vampires become blood-mad killers that exist only to feed. Like enraged, starved beasts, they run rampant, devouring whole villages in an effort to satiate their never-ending thirst. As well as devouring the living, a Vargulf will ransack graves and feast upon the bodies of the dead. A Vargulf has a monstrous body, swollen by a constant diet of red meat. Unbound by human form, a Vargulf is a contorted mass of just packed muscle, giving it the strength to crush a chariot or bowl over entire ranks of warriors foolish enough to try and pin it down. Powerful legs and broad wing flaps allow Vargulfs to chase down their skills in swift, gliding leaps, and they can lash out at enemies around them with their claws at shocking speed, though they cannot fly. A Vargulf's main weapon, however, is a wide mouth filled with the dagger-like fangs capable of puncturing armor and crushing skulls. Other vampires consider them no better than ghouls, though the terrible changes wrought by their surrender to the beast within makes them far more deadlier in combat. Though voracious and unpredictable killers, Vargulfs are far from mindless. They do not possess the aptitude or inclination for sorcery of their vampiric cousins, but their presence still acts as a conduit for dark magic, and are thus they are able to ring-knit themselves with this necromancy should they suffer any injury. It is important to note that this re rejuvenation is an even more increased version of what they are naturally capable of uh, as a normal vampire, and it seems to almost be instinctual rather than a conscious effort of will. Thus they can still be bound to a vampire lord's will and forced to serve in his army as a kind of he heavy shock troop, I'd say. In Total War, the Vargulf acts like a living battering ram. Literally. <laughs> they are excellent at taking down castle um, doors. They hit hard, regenerate, and are pretty fast, especially for an undead army. They also do exceptional armor piercing, but being bestial in nature, they lack the leadership to sustain combat without sport, without any support for an extended time. And then we move on to the terror geists, which are the largest and most ferocious bat species to have ever existed. So large and terrifying that they've grown to the size of dragons. In the hidden reaches of Sylvania, these titanic bats soar out from their caves to hunt horses, caravans, and pegasus under the sickly skies. It is the ambush tactic of these creatures that gives them their truly terrifying reputation. A terrorgeist vision is poor, so the swooping monstrosity ensures that its prey is rendered motionless by emitting a piercing shriek. So loud and unexpected it can stun even a Bretonian warhorse into paralysis. 
At the precise moment, the Terror Geist will dive down, gather up Ryder and Mount in its talons, and return to its lair to glut itself on the warm blood of its victims. It is the mortal remains of these troglodytic beasts that the ghoul kings of the caverns bind to their service. The binding process comes easily to these reclusive vampires, for Strutogoy, ghoul kings, and terror geists have much in common. As dark magic swirls around the monstrous cave creature, a bond of blood is formed between master and beast, much like any other creature that drinks from a ghoul king's veins. Terror geists have necromantic power running in their blood that can heal even the most severe of wounds. Very, very similar to Crypt Ghouls, actually, in this um, idea of them being kind of giving a bastardization of the blood kiss in a way. Just they are f fed off of the blood of the Strigoi in this um, aspect. Now, as you can see, the Terror Geist is actually a creature from the Warhammer world. It's not a dragon or some kind of amalgamation of parts, as you might try to see whenever you look at it. But in Total War, the Terror Geist is a powerful flying monster that has an anti-large bonus, meaning that it excels at hunting cavalry and large monsters or lords on large mounts <laughs> or monsters themselves making it one of the most useful monsters in the roster, as it also hits hard with armor-piercing damage and has a breath attack in the form of its sonic blast, which is actually pretty decent at taking out um, big clumps of infantry or even doing pretty severe damage to large targets. And then we have the mighty zombie dragon, which are the reanimated corpses of long-dead dragons that were raised from their resting places within the Plane of Bones by the use of powerful dark magic. The Plain of Bones is a harsh and lifeless landscape of multicolored sand and tainted rock located to the east of the world's edge mountains, from which protrude high rib cages of ancient primeval dragons. This is the place where dragons of ancient times once came to die, to rest their bones amongst those of their ancestors as they had done for millions of years, before any other sentient beings walked the world. Here lies the bones of the great ancestral dragons, Skulls the size of castle towers lie mingled with leg bones larger than the mast of an imperial warship. These bones date from the ancient days of the draconic race. Though today's dragons are of a lesser breed, they are still incomparably mightier than other races of the world. However, following the arrival of Chaos, the Plane of Bones has since become saturated with large amounts of dark magic. This magic eventually contaminated the remains of these dragons, forcing them to rise once more as the first zombie dragons. Ever since then, vampires and powerful necromancers of all kinds have been known to take a pilgrimage to this ancient landscape where they pick through one amongst the many dragon remains. Once he finds a suitable corpse, the vampire or necromancer who uses the excess dark magic that contaminates the land to resurrect the dragon back to life as his eternal combat mount. These once majestic creatures stagger upright once more with a great despairing roar before stooping to allow their new master to ride atop their powerful shoulders. You can think of the Plain of Bones as a kind of elephant graveyard almost, except it's obviously for dragons. Not only do the dragons retain their terrifying combat power and undeath, but even though their wings are tattered and rotten, the necromantic magic makes them capable of flight once again. In addition to this, where once they could breathe gouts of fire, they now breathe mist of pestilent death, capable of eating the flesh from your bones and corroding armor. In Total War, the zombie dragon is a mount for your standard lord and a few of the legendary ones, and can be taken alone. It has access to its poisonous breath and is good for all that a dragon is good for, whether crushing elite infantry, heavy cavalry, or really anything you need it to do besides probably running into halberds or, you know, demigriff knights. <laughs> so it is definitely a, a very powerful unit in their roster. And then we move on to the Abyssal Terrors, also known as Winged Nightmares. It is a term given to a wide variety of terrifyingly powerful monsters, living or undead, that serves as combat mounts for only the most warlike vampires. 
Some of these monsters are creatures of chaos born from the mountains and resurrected hybrids of beasts or resurrected monsters that were given life with the use of necromancy. Others are nightmarish creations that were given bodies of writhing blood and flayed skin thanks to the use of science and dark magic. The most common of these variants are generally winged creatures. Most abyssal terrors are inevitably born to war on ragged wings, allowing their undead masters to strike at the heart of the enemy army. The latter day von Karsteins, for their part, were known for the use of a huge wolf headed variant with slavering jaws and leathery wings. The exposed spinal columns and bony tails of this particular mount oozed with a numbing poison that drew all warmth from those it infected. The Necrock Brotherhood is said to favor these mounts more so than other bloodlines and relish the challenge of combining sorcery and science in an unholy union to create such an abomination. Now these are obviously a mount choice for vampire lords from the 8th edition army book and they didn't make it the total gore. Um, and honestly, I don't see the point. It is simply a slightly better barded nightmare with poison attacks. And that is probably the reason that CA has not included it in their roster so far. And I honestly don't see them adding it as it is much, not much better than the Flying Nightmare Horse. And certainly not anywhere close to being powerful enough to warrant um, not taking a zombie dragon in its place. If you're going to make that choice. And that is it for the monsters. And now we will be moving into the war machines. Now a quick note on the monsters. As you can see, all the monsters actually fulfill a specific tactical role. They are the glue that brings the army together. If the zombies and skeletons are the bulk, the, the brick, the monsters are the mortar. They're the ones that kind of keep everything together help screen out the dangers that possess that um, come forward at a vampire count's army since they can't weather <laughs> um, artillery or skirmishing fire that well so all the monsters are usually either fast or extremely hard hitting and used to breach a hole quicker in the enemy's line so that you can inevitably overrun them with sheer numbers but you have to make it there to use your numbers and so therefore all the flying units and the very very fast um, lighter units are what you would use to screen out the enemy and prevent them from doing the damage that they want to do to you since the best way to deal with a vampire count army is to skirmish it into oblivion so let's move on to war machines and you might be thinking to yourself the vampire counts don't have any war machines well, technically, they do, if you look at the army books. And the first is the Corpse Cart, which acts as a magnet to uh, dark magic, drawing their power from the land itself and using said power in either bolstering the combat abilities of nearby undead or to raise them back into battle. Sometimes a corpse cart is hung with a great bell, the clapper of which is a fell lodestone of Eldritch Provenance. When necromantic magic is thick in the air, the bell tolls and ripples of dark magic emanates from the corpse cart. Under the influence of this ominous knell, the dead are drawn back together and cadavers stagger to their feet. Other corpse carts are lit by braziers that burn with supernatural flames. The smoke from these bell fires contains particles of warpstone that have the horrific ability of driving enemy wizards temporarily insane. Now, what is most interesting about corpse carts is that they are, well, actually were all created during the time in the empire of the Black Plague started by the Skaven. The disgraced priest of Moor turned necromancer Van Hal at the time created all that exists to this day, though he lost control of them and many have been put to the torch over the years. Now in Total War we get several different versions of the corpse cart. They were all quite invaluable in that they support your shambling horde. Making a fodder zombie or skeleton warrior into a much more dangerous unit by either constantly regenerating them without the use of your own magical spells or buffing their combat stats making them better in combat both defensively and attacking more importantly. In addition to this they also can make it easier to draw in winds of magic 
aiding in spellcasting. So all in all, they're an excellent support unit, which the Vampire Counts desperately need <laughs> to stay in the fight, depending on what kind of build you're going with. And that leads us straight into the Mortis Engine, which is a horrific magical artifact that radiates strongly with dark magic and is kept afloat by a horde of vengeful spirits. Within the Mortis Engine are powerful relics that are saturated with strong amounts of dark magic, such as the remains of powerful necromancers and lich lords of ancient times. Mortis Engines are almost always watched over by deathless attendants known as Corpse Masters trusted servants of the Vampire Counts whom have proven immune to the dire energies that emanate from the relics within. When the Corpse Master removes the locks and opens the lead-lined reliquary, the deadly artifact within can be held aloft, leeching enemies' life energy away and invigorating any nearby undead creatures. The longer a battle rages, the more energies the relic absorbs, and the most powerful it becomes. The Mortis Engines can typically be found where the fighting is thickest, ominously drifting into bloody battle lines. Such positions simultaneously fuel the engine with the energies of the dying and allow the engine to support undead forces when the fighting is at its thickest. They kind of act like a makeshift chariot in a way, though not a very good chariot. <laughs> They're mostly for their uh, combat buffs is what you take them for. Now the Mortis engine in Total War functions much like it does in Tabletop. It quickly regenerates nearby troops much faster than a corpse card even can, and has a life-leeching quality that drags down the enemy over time, making this a must-have for combating elite infantry or monsters with large health pools. It also, much like the tabletop, will explode upon death and take nearby units, even friendly units, to the grave <laughs> with its death rattle. And then we move on to the Coven Thrones which are large, exquisitely luxurious thrones that bear a coven of vampires across the battlefield, borne aloft by the departed spirits of those slain by the vampire. Compensating for a cursed existence with the grandeur and luxury is a common theme amongst the vampire elite. A true lord, or lady, of undeath refuses to churn through the mud of a battlefield like a common peasant, or be content with the dubious dignity of sitting astride a grave beast. Instead, the monarchs of the night were often born to war on gilded palaquins known as coven thrones. These bone frame constructs are held aloft by the departed spirits of those who have fallen in love with their owners and gotten nothing in return but a violent death. Mortal men shiver in awestruck disbelief at the exotic beauty of the handmaidens lounging upon these coven thrones. Hypnotized by a beguiling glance, a kiss upon the air, or a subtle finger beckoning them into eternal servitude. The Lamians are hedonistic, self-indulgent creatures that take great pains to present themselves in splendor and majesty at all times. Thus the coven thrones that carry the Lamian sisterhood are bedecked with the rare artifacts and strewn with silk, embroidered cushions, and other finery. Over the centuries, the Lamians have become skilled in the arts of fortune telling in order to stay one step ahead of the agents who pursue them. The Coven Thrones bear great enchanted bowls full of fresh virgin's blood within which the vampire's handmaidens can scry the future. Why the Lamians' final purpose is, however, none can fathom. Despite their luxury, these ostentatious palaquins are potent weapons upon the battlefield. The vampires themselves move so swift swiftly as to be virtually invisible to the eye, but their true strength lies in their unity. A coven of vampires fighting as one is a formidable a prospect as any dragon or demon lord. And as you can tell from the description, the coven throne is primarily a Lamian world altar and it's supposed to be a rather powerful one. Its model is actually damn near identical to the Mortis engine, but it doesn't quite give off the same beneficial effects to those around it. Instead, it kind of acts like a high damage chariot of sorts. Now, it's obviously not in Total War, and I do not have very high hopes of ever seeing the Coven Throne in Total War, unless we get a Lamian faction one day, and then these would be a good way of separating the ladies of the bloodline from the Borish lords of the vampire accounts. But until then, I don't really see the point of its inclusion, and that's about all I've got to say on that. And then we move on to the Black Coaches, 
which are, as their name suggests, coaches that are painted jet black and driven by the servants of the undead, driven forward by a pair of nightmares and a scythe-wielding wraith. These coaches serve as a way of transporting a vampire anywhere he wishes, protecting him from the baleful sun and plowing through any opposition that would dare to stand in his way. These morbid carriages are omens of disaster and death. They are horrific, unholy things, neither wholly real nor immaterial. A black coach is a herald of famine, war, and murder, the sight of which can drive a sane man to suicide and cause families to fall upon themselves. Black coaches serve as the principal transport for vampires to cross large tracts of land without having to face the bayful rains of the sun. They also serve to transport the remains of vampires into places of slaughter, for a vampire can never truly die and can still be resurrected should all his remains be placed in a casket and sent to places saturated with death magic. By creating a black coach, the vampire's retainers can transport their master's rejuvenating form to places of slaughter. This allows the vampires to revivify himself, drinking in the coalescing energies that swirl around the crucible of war. Each black coach is a magnet for such baleful forces as it drives onward. It soaks in the energies of the battlefield, shimmering with sorcerer's power until it is all but unstoppable, driven on by the undying will of the vampire crouch within. The black coach crushes uh, or scythes down the ranks of the enemy that are foolish enough to stand in its way. As you can see, the Black Coach, in the lore at least, is a powerful and dreaded unit of destruction. Sadly, in Total War, it is not all it's cracked up to be. It is one of the very few true armor-piercing kind of odd forms of cavalry at the Vampire's disposal, but it does not ever perform as well as a group of Blood Knights or Hex Wraiths would, and it is almost as expensive as those units. Though it does cause terror and has a bit of a niche when it comes to routing low leadership troops and mucking up skirmishers as it actually has a decent amount of armor which does protect it in the uh, long run. And that is going to be it for the war machines. As you can see the actual war machines for the vampire counts are not actually like trebuchets and mortars and things like that. You obviously knew that ahead of time but they are more of a kind of buffing synergy kind of focus they really help improve in some way either through rejuvenating the troops or giving good combat buffs or debuffs to the enemy and so that's what their primary role is on the battlefield now we should um move into the heroes actually of the vampire armies now there are the vampires which you should all know what a vampire is by now. <laughs> so I've done extensive videos on various bloodlines. So feel free to look over those for more details. I will not be going into them um, here as this video is already long enough as it is. As well as the next hero is the Necromancer, which I also highly detailed in the Necromancer video. So also feel free for more details to see that video. So let's move on to the actual newer heroes that I haven't discussed yet. And let's start off with the uh, Tomb Banshees. Tomb Banshees, known by the Bretonians as Wailing Hags, and to the Dwarfs as the Freezing Shriek, or just simply Banshees, are the bitter, restless spirits of long-dead sorceresses, enchantresses, and witches that have in life plagued the lands of the Old World for centuries. They fear crossing the void to face whatever punishment awaits them for their evil deeds, and so it is an easy matter for a vampire to bind them to his service. Tomb Banshees constantly howl in remembrance of the forbidden pleasures of the life that once was theirs, and in bitterness for the peace of the grave that they cannot attain. Their grief-stricken wails can be lethal to mortals and strike terror into the hearts of all who hear them. Those who do not have a will of iron can die of sheer fright upon hearing the mournful screams of the Tomb Banshee. Blood trickles from their ears and fills up the whites of their eyes as the mind-wrenching shriek takes its supernatural toll. Fully armored knights collapse lifeless from their saddles and whole ranks of infantry flail lifelessly as the Banshee does her evil work. A Tomb Banshee's visage is sunken and skull-like, framed by lank hair that rides like a nest of serpents. She is swathed in filmy shrouds and grave robes that swirl with a life of their own, or drift and cling to the wearer's slender frame, as if she was carried forwards by underwater currents. Each Tomb Banshee is surrounded by flickering ghost lights, all that remains of the men she murdered whilst alive. 
These glowing will-of-wisps are forced by some strange alchemy of the soul to crackle and swirl around their tormentor, disembodied ghostly heads etched with a permanent expression of fear. A single banshee is a terrifying prospect, and even those warriors skilled enough to match blades with a vampire have little defense against her unnatural scream. It is not unheard of for one of the most powerful undead lords to find several of these to their surface. Now, Banshees in Total War act as a kind of assassin for the vampires. Being ethereal, they are excellent for taking on damn near any other hero and lord, as long as they don't do magic damage. As the Banshees suffer from the same issue of magical being a hard counter to taking her as her natural defense is actually pretty low, with her being an ethereal unit. But she does cause terror and can also be used as a decent flanker or an anchor to tie down an enemy cavalry or infantry unit that can't be handled by other troops until the resources can be spared to deal with them. As her ethereal nature also makes her surprisingly durable, especially for an assassin character in the, on the battlefield. And then we move on to the dreaded White King which were once ancient and immensely powerful human warlords that had at one time occupied the lands of present-day Sylvania in the days before the founding of the Empire. When imbued with dark magic, these ancient warlords rise from their crypts as white kings, eyes glowing with a natural life. Originally, these remains were once protected by ancient runes and talismans conducted by the earliest forms of wizards or shamans to aid in warding off potential grave robbers and scavengers from desecrating their resting places. The chieftains of ancient tribes were buried in their full ceremonial panoply, with bronze breastplates protecting their ribs and winged helms framing their grinning skulls. The tribe's shamans placed the best swords, axes, and spears in their death grips of the ancient kings as they were laid on their slabs. The interior walls of the barrels were painted with scenes of the leader's life so that they should so that should they awaken, they would be reminded of their greatest deeds and most heroic victories. Even today, there are still a few scattered tribes of men living within the vaults that still follow this ancient ritual. However, these once potent protections have since been destroyed, defaced, or corrupted by agents of the vampire counts. Without these protections, these ancient warlords are susceptible to the corrupting influence of a particularly powerful necromancer. A few of these mounds have also been known to be conduits for dark magic, making the restless soul to continuously flicker back and forth from the world of the living and the world of the dead. In time, the amount of dark magic being gathered is enough to raise a white king from the grave without the need of a necromancer to recite the needed ritual. These events are rare, however, as most white kings are usually raised unwillingly from their rest by determined vampires and necromancers. White kings are incredibly powerful undead, almost as hard to destroy as vampires. Suffused with dark magic, a white king's weapons shimmers with baleful energy. The merest touch of the spear tip or blade can drain the life from their foes, or slice through flesh and bone with an ease that is wholly unnatural. Clad in ancient armor, their flesh all but withered away, there is little for an adversary to cut or stab. Even to stand before one of these skeletal warriors of antiquity takes an extreme effort of will. For these reasons, a vampire will often charge a white king with carrying forth the undead general's personal banner. Such a duty is often integral to the army's stability, and those indomitable undead warriors are able to hold aloft the army's standard while tirelessly striking down one foe after another on the battlefield. The white king is probably my most favorite vampire count unit which is why you got the full description <laughs> from the Ari book even at the end of this very long video they are much stronger than they look as they are often underestimated thought to be just a simple graveyard though that is until they take on a regiment of men single-handedly and slaughter them they owe the strength to the overwhelming amount of dark magic that is infused them, and they actually have a great deal of autonomy when compared to other undead, even Graveguard. In fact, sometimes there are examples in the lore of White Kings leading small portions of armies with a Graveguard bound to their own will. This can be seen by the most famous of what I consider a White King in the ancient and indomitable Follower of Corn the ever-living Krell, and his necromantic sidekick, Kimmler. <laughs> 
In Total War, the White King acts like a empire captain of sorts. Good for training your army and making them more formidable, as for assaulting enemy armies and weakening them before a battle even starts. However, during combat they cannot be underestimated as they are damn near as strong as any other vampire lord in his own right. They are very formidable units and they just look awesome. So there is also that. And that is it for the heroes. So we would move on to lords at this time, but as far as lords are concerned, I have once again already covered them all in previous videos. You have the Master Necromancer, which is essentially just a beefed up necromancer. The Vampire Lord, which we've discussed, and the Strigoi Cool King. All of these have been detailed in previous videos, and all the Legendary Lords will be getting their own videos in the near future, so stay tuned for that. And so I would recommend going and watching the previous videos I've done on the Vampire Counts if you want more details on the Lord types. And so now that we have gone over the roster, let's briefly discuss how the vampires work as an army. As you might be able to tell from the roster, the Vampire Count's army, and sadly that is all it is as the various bloodlines were kind of retroactively removed in 8th edition and simply classified as vampires without their own unique army types. But the Undead Horde is just that. It's a horde. It is mostly comprised of low-cost shambling corpses and skeletons that alone would pose almost no threat, but in the numbers they can be brought are terrifying. The Vampire Army is more of a slow methodical grind, as an enemy is brought down by sapping his strength from fighting fodder troops and then finished off with the more elite units in the roster, mainly Graveguard, and the more exotic monsters. The Vampire Counts rely on engaging and surrounding their foes, utilizing the Fear and Terror debuffs to rout the enemy, then chase them with their either Hounds, Flyers, or their rather formidable cavalry. But this isn't their only strength, as they are heavily reliant on sorcery and can wield a multitude of devastating spells and buffs for their lackluster units, making them into combat monstrosities. In this way, the Vampire Counts are also a deceptively strong roster after you take into account all of their magical prowess. However, that is also a double-edged sword with the Vampire Count's roster. As some of you might have guessed that a Vampire Count's army is only held together by its magic wielders. Whether this be a vampire or a necromancer, the entire army is reliant on a single unit for its survival meaning a canny opponent will find a way of dealing the undead infantry and eliminate the undead overlord, thereby crippling the army and watch it crumble to pieces before doing any serious damage. This is in fact a favorite tactic in Total War, especially online play and multiplayer. In this way, the vampire army's lack of any kind of ranged combat besides spells Work is a serious detriment as artillery and skirmishers, if not dealt with quickly, can pick apart your mighty shambling horde long before it even engages in melee, as it is exactly that, extremely slow. But as we have gone over before, there are plenty of varying ways of dealing with that, and that is where the more specialized monster units and cavalry come into play, like the Vargais and Blood Knights. But, and even direwolves and felbats, to be honest, uh, for preventing your army from being shredded before ever even getting into combat, which is the main ideal with the Vampire Counts. It is to get in combat as soon as possible and start dealing damage because you cannot sit back at range and hope to accomplish anything. And finally, that is about it for this army roster video on the Vampire Counts. I sincerely hope you enjoyed the video and possibly learned something new about the Vampire Counts. I would like to personally say thank you to anyone who actually made it to the end here of the video. And of course to my loyal subscribers who of course joined the ever infamous Cult of Thick. All you thick boys out there. <laughs> if you haven't already, it would really help me out if you both liked this video and subscribed to the channel for any future content. And of course, more lore videos. As long as you guys are watching, I will keep churning out content for you as quickly as I can these days. Now, if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comment section and I will do my best to answer them. Or possibly include them in a future video. Probably my Q&A videos I do occasionally. About, I want to do them about once a month. 
um, is the idea at least. And there is, of course, more lore content coming soon, and we will be looking into the many legendary lords of the Vampire Counts roster. As always, I have been Jumbo Thick. Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you all again very soon. Have a good day.